My name is Erin De Silva. I'm one of the instructional designers here in the EdTech department at Dartmouth. I am so pleased you were able to join us. We had a great first panel and Q&A sessions that did not have nearly enough time to answer the cues. <laughs> and so um, just a reminder that we do have a reception following this, our second half of the panel in the AHRC, which is located on the first floor of Bartlett Hall. And well-earned refreshments will be available at that time. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited about the folks that we have up next to speak with you. And I encourage you to start you know, m mentally asking those questions in your head. We will invite them up after everyone has had a chance to speak so that we can get a conversation going about um, to get those questions answered. And we will continue the conversation after that. All right, to start us off, I am so pleased to introduce Dartmouth's own Steve Swain. Steve is the Jacob H. Strauss 1922 Professor of Music here at Dartmouth College. He works in American musical theater, Russian music, opera, and the intersections of music, neuroscience, and ethics. He's the author of two books, How Sondheim Found His so Sound, excuse me, and Orpheus in Manhattan, William Schumann, and the Shaping of Americans, America's Musical Life. This, by the way, was the winner of the 2012 AC ASCAP can I say that? Okay, good. Uh, Nicholas Slonimsky Award for Outstanding Musical Biography. Steve's Dartmouth X course just launched this week. Introduction to Italian Opera is in full swing, and we're so pleased. Um, and his talk for you today, which I will probably massacre the title of, you'll do better, is the making of beautiful music. Thank you, Steve. So you have to look at the title. There's a pun on the word MOOC in there. So that's what's going on with that. Music takes time. I mean these words in the capacious sense that few human, few human endeavors are instantaneous in their execution. Just as it takes time to read a book or philosophize or to learn a language, it takes time to engage in making music, to listening to that music and in articulating one's understanding of the music that has been made and heard. But I mostly mean that music takes time in the more immediate and operational sense. We often invite students within a classroom setting to revisit something that was assigned for the day's class. But in my experience as a student, I don't recall large stretches within a classroom setting given over to what one might call basic access to the materials under discussion. Maybe Don does this or Jed does this, but I don't. I don't remember sitting together in our classroom and quietly rereading a chapter or two of Melville or a tract by Hume or an essay by, by Montaigne. Um, the teaching of music, in contrast, routinely requires the sitting together in a classroom and quietly listening to swaths of music so that we might improve our ability to identify theorize about and contextualize that music. I think of my colleagues in film and media studies as sharing this particular challenge, one where the instructor must always allocate sufficient time within the teaching environment for the collective experience of the works under discussion. Now, as I was thinking about this, I did not wish to say, and I do not mean to say, that music takes time away from the teaching of music. Uh, for this would privilege the words of the instructor as being more important than the works under discussion. And I do not feel that listening to music in the classroom in any way, shape, or form is a net loss. Far from it, instructors and teachers of music must periodically stop the talking and engage in active, focused listening to make the talking make sense. Even so, there's no question, no getting around the fact that quiet, active listening happens while the classroom clock is ticking. Music takes time. 
So it has been a challenge for me in working on a massive open online course devoted to introducing students to Italian opera to find a workable balance between talking about music and listening to music. I won't take time today to explore with you the thorny questions of copyright law and the doctrine of fair use as they relate to the use of music and media in our course other than to say we distilled or maybe I distilled the issues into one single three word phrase, let's get sued. But we have constantly, our team, our team has constantly wrestled with how much music we would provide our students within lectures and within the MOOC platform, ever aware of the research edX provided us that shows viewing tapers off after around minute seven. So in a case where music takes time, we have had to design a music course that provides ample opportunity to hear music, yet that also doesn't overwhelm students with lengthy examples within the average lecture. One way we sought to address this tension was to make clear from the outset that our project isn't simply about learning names and titles from the world of Italian opera. Our project at its core is far more elemental and perhaps subversive than that. We are aiming to make the time one spends listening to music far more productive. As I said in the teaser for the course, a portion of which is now on the figurative editing room floor, uh, we'll engage in assignments that will help us not only in listening to Italian opera, but also in knowing what to listen for in Italian opera. And we'll develop tools and strategies that will allow us to derive even more enjoyment from a form of human endeavor that enthralls and amazes us. It's the tools and strategies part that interested us most. And we directed much of our efforts in designing the course on how to reinforce the acquisition of those tools and strategies, knowing that such acquisition takes time. So let me illustrate what our project entailed with two elements that run throughout our MOOC, and then we'll apply them here together. The first element, which appears repeatedly in the rubrics Adam Nemiroff and I designed for the course, is to encourage students to describe music using relatively objective terms. I find that students tend to reach for emotional and visual descriptors when they hear music. Um, one of my favorites was when I played fanfare for the common man in a class, a student said it sounded like a plane going over a cornfield, to which I asked, what would a helicopter going over a cornfield sound like? It's problematic to reach for these things. What sounds sad to me may sound poignant to you. So we ask students to answer questions like, is the music fast or slow? Is it loud or soft? Are there many voices and instruments? Or are there few voices and instruments? And what relative changes happen as the music takes its time to unfold? Such questions help listeners to stay focused on the act of listening and not allow themselves to get swept away by the power and beauty of the musical moments. I should state emphatically that I have no, de no desire to erase that power or that beauty, but I do want to give students a simple vocabulary of terms that they can use to talk to and understand one another when we collectively listen to the same piece of music. The second element in the course that I hammer home repeatedly, perhaps uh, ad nauseum uh, to some of our team members, is that in the world of opera, the best exemplars of the genre are those where the realization of intense dramatic expression occurs by essentially musical means. 
Adam, I was kind of looking at you and you looked like you were mouthing that with me. I distill that into five words. I won't ask the team to say it with me, but they know it. The music conveys the drama. If we listen closely, taking into account issues of speed and rhythm and volume and number of participants, and if we use those observations to posit what dramatic situations and emotional states might be thus conveyed, we are exercising and expanding our capacity to gather information from a media source that, on its surface, might seem to be all about the expression of pleasure. I posit that both in the residential section and in a session, uh, sorry, in the residential setting and in the MOOC, that there are ways to make ever more efficient uses of the fact that music takes time by simply learning what to listen for. It's not terribly provocative, but it's surprisingly helpful. And so now, as I'm looking at this talk, I want to engage with you in an experiment. I'm going to play for you an excerpt from an opera. Now, you're in luck. It doesn't have words. So you don't have to strain yourself to comprehend what's being sung. But I would ask you to practice the two elements I just mentioned. How would you describe the music in objective terms? And what dramatic situations and emotional states might be portrayed in this music? I know that some of you will recognize this excerpt, and so I ask you not to leap to the conclusion that you already know what to say about the music. I'm putting it before you for the sake of taking time to listen to the music closely, to prepare ourselves to describe the music objectively and to extrapolate as to what intense dramatic expressions might be sketched out through the music this composer has written. The piece lasts about three and a half minutes. I would encourage you to take out something that you can record your thoughts on. Uh, if it's a digital device, I encourage you to shut down all other uh, ways of looking at things. This is not a time to check Facebook or to send texts, but to listen to this, to take notes of is it fast, is it slow, is it loud, is it soft? Are there many voices or a few voices? How do the changes happen? And what dramatic situations and emotional states might this music convey? Are you ready? I didn't warn you about the next thing I want you to do, but I'd like you to do it anyway. And that is to talk to the person next to you, to talk about some of the things that you noticed in terms of fast and slow or soft and loud, maybe the emotional states and the dramatic situations. Would you be so kind as to do that for me? I notice in my prepared remarks here that I didn't even indicate uh, for me to tell you what this piece is. So I, I'm, I'm somewhat curious how many of you know what I just played. That's what I thought. Um, all right. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, in the interest of time, I'm going to continue on. That was the prelude, the very opening of um, the 1853 opera by Giuseppe Verdi, La Traviata. If you know the story of the movie Pretty Woman, it's based on that story, all right? Um, that's funny? Okay, whatever. The questions that were presented to us in this symposium asked us three things. The first asked us to think about teaching arts and humanities to a global audience. I haven't fully fleshed out my answer to that question, but I have uh, adumbrated some things that uh, to tell you something about my answer. We'll come back to that later. The second question spoke to scaling learning opportunities in the arts and humanities to accommodate such a large classroom. Uh, again, I'll try to answer that in the Q&A uh, session that we'll have at the end of this panel. Uh, 
But it's the third question that I'd like to ponder with you here. It asked us to think about how we instructors might change our teaching strategies in the residential classroom based on our experiences in the digital learning sandbox. And I have a fairly easy answer for that. The kind of experience we just shared together where I talked for about seven minutes and then we engaged together in a different modality of directed discovery, which was followed by a sharing our insights with each other and then me bringing us back together. I think I've done that once before in my time here at Dartmouth, just once. As I look ahead to the next time I teach my opera course here on campus, I will be looking for ways to do what we just did. I'm sure some of those ways will be more successful than others, just as not every lecture is a home run, to use the metaphor of the month. I don't expect every module of mixed learning strategies to bring the point home. What I do sense will change, and this is the most exciting aspect of what is happening to me as I rethink how to teach in a residential setting, is my expectation that students will internalize the process of learning far more deeply than they do at present. At the end of the day, that process of taking in new information, of applying it to a new set of experiences and turning that into knowledge, of extending that knowledge through interaction with other learners, both novice and expert, and of reframing the initial information to future situations, that process is far more important than is the ability to regurgitate facts and figures and names and titles. I'll confess that I feel I've already been somewhat successful in helping students in their grasp of using musical time to make sense of the moments. Yesterday, out of the blue, I received an email from a student who graduated in 2006. I went to see Otello, he writes, with my sister last night at the Met and couldn't help but go back to History of Opera and remember your moving lecture on this masterpiece. The tenor was a bit underwhelming to me, but I do recognize it is an unbelievably difficult part. The soprano and baritone were amazing, the set design clever and beautiful, all in all a wonderful performance. I hope that this email finds you well and can't thank you enough for expanding my passion of opera beyond Rigoletto. His remark about Rigoletto is, uh, well, first of all, that was written by Verdi, and it was his favorite opera, one he knew from high school, and I told him, that's wonderful, you will not get to write on Rigoletto in my class. But I am struck by the notion of him taking this information from 12 years ago and applying it to his situation today. And isn't that what we teachers want to see happen? So as members of our Opera MOOC team know, it's not uncommon for me to get notes like this from time to time, but I think I might be able to increase that sense of wonder and excitement in the Opera MOOC world and in my other courses by breaking down the elements of the topic at hand in a brief lecture, inviting us all to apply those elements to a novel task, reflecting with one another our success or failure in that exercise, and coming back together to use what we discovered to make new insights. For those of us who are at Dartmouth, uh, you'll understand this a little bit better, but I'm doing a first year writing seminar next term. It's a 2A. I intend to do what I just did for us in four blocks every class session. We'll see how it works. This recursive and iterative form of learning isn't completely new to me, as I said, and I recognize that it's going to take work on my part and time on my part to get this right. But having taught music for so long, I'm accustomed to good things taking time, especially music. Thank you. Thank you.